Yo! What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. It is a brand new episode of Liam Picks Fights Presents Bets and Banter. And you know we got to come back strong. We had a great week last week. They robbed us on Brian Battle. That was cold. That was brutal. We had the read. We had the bets. But unfortunately, they would not let us cash them. We still bought the Brian Battle t-shirt that's in the mail. You know that's coming. So in any case, guys, I wanted to say appreciate everybody for being here. Thanks for rocking with us. And you know we can't do it alone. It's bets and banter. You might have said to yourself, where's first look this week? And we'll get you some bonus content later in the week because first look, it just couldn't happen. This card, guys, we're searching the bottom of the barrel. I didn't know who half these people are, and I watch the UFC each and every week. So for me, this is just a card that I had to do an extra amount of research in order to even feel prepared for the show. Now, in this case, let's bring on our guest, the man that you're waiting for. Rich is in the building. How are you, my brother? Just win, baby. Back once again. What's up, bro? Yeah, back on time this week. Uh, I'm pissed at Looster as well. I had a 10-unit swing on that um, Brian Battle fight. I had ITD submission. It was my uh, biggest bet of the card, so super pissed off, man. Um, should we talk about the Dorgari and C-Rod decision real quick? Um, because I didn't yeah, think it was it's a hot topic of the week, right? We're we're MMA uh recappers this week. What what you got? Yeah, so I said pre-fight, why are you all betting Dolgarian when you don't know what his cardio is like? It's all well, you know, hearing things in the gym that he's this beast and the rest of it and fucking submitting alligators down in Miami and all this weird shit. But yeah, it played out exactly how I predicted, man. He was going to smash frame one. C-Rod's durable. So what the fuck are we doing here, man? Like he's, he's a liability um, at the um, favorite price. So I'm glad everyone got burnt, to be honest. Whoever bet Dolgari in pre-fight, I think C-Rod Live was the play. You could have got him at plus 500. Um, and yeah, round two, my take on it is you can have four minutes of control time, but if you're not going to do anything with it, and in my opinion, you're holding on for dear life because you know your cardio is compromised, then fuck you, man. Like, he hit the knee as well. Um, there was a few strikes in that round, and C-Rod had this most significant one, so... I'm glad it's got scored towards him. If I had a bet Dolgarian, I'd probably be pissed as well, crying about it. But yeah, that's my take on it, man. It's 2024, isn't it? You don't get rewarded these days for laying on people. So take it into consideration going forward, man. What you reckon? You know, Rich, I thought that it was a fantastic fight. I want to start there. Um, you know, I don't think there's a lot of people that survived that round one um, from Dolgarian, truthfully. And, and I mentioned that before the fight. And for me, the cap was, you know, fundamentally a little bit off here. And the reason being uh, was because I believed that C-Rod was going to be too small for the weight. I mean, I thought that the guy looked, you know, fine in the octagon in terms of his size. He got bullied a little bit in round one. I, I just think that's going to happen to people against Dolgari. And I don't think most people have felt that kind of pace, that kind of strength. Um, and so it's going to be a problem for people. But I messaged Isaac because I really believe in his skills. And I, what I had tried to say, um, you know, from a place of humility and respect is that I think that, you know, when you get somebody into those dominant positions in the first round, unload with the elbows, man, he's a, he's a menacing person from the top position. He's very difficult to move. He's got that heavy pressure. And I felt like he burned his arms in this fight by going for a lot of submission attempts early. And it's really hard to squeeze guys. I'll just let you know, there's times when you go to squeeze something in grappling and your bicep just like you feel like a tug and you're like, oh, God, what did I just do? And that's just normal grappling, right? That's just going around to jujitsu with local you know, people and stuff, right? It's, it's not in a fight against another professional athlete, another trained cage fighter. Both these guys are lifelong martial artists, right? For Isaac, it's like he's been on the wrestling mats. That prepares you for a seven minute hellacious pace. But I've mentioned to people before, why don't you have wrestling matches that are, you know, nine minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes fit? It's ridiculous. The, uh, the amount of exertion that you go through in a wrestling match, you can only do it for six, seven minutes before your body just starts to give out, right? Even high level athletes. So what I think that we saw in that fight is a guy go out there with about nine minutes of a really hard push and he was flagging. And I said in, in the Patreon chat, whatever, I'm like, you know, this guy is exhausted right now. Like I could just tell you, I know from my own experience, he's going to come out drunk in round three. He's going to come out there just trying to hold on for dear life in round three. And I did think that was a little bit of what we saw, but I think that when you haven't gone somewhere, it's really hard to know how you're going to fare 
right? It's hard to know how it's going to feel. And I think that in a real in-fight scenario against a guy who could really push into round three, he just found himself wanting more. And I think he spent too much of it early going for chokes, right? And I, I think that you only take the choke if they're giving it to you. Do damage from that top position because you had a great spot. Although you did see two judges score a 10-8 in round one. I scored a 10-8 personally in round one as well when I was watching the fight live. I did score round two for Dolgarian while I was watching the fight live. I thought it was extremely close, though. And I was like, I, I have no idea who the judges are going to give this to. If you remember before the show, I said the only play I felt like you could make is C-Rod after round one here. Because, like, just survive. Like, see if he survives that, I felt like. Before you invest your money, that's how I felt. But then when he did, like you said, Rich, he got insane plus money prices live. And, um, you know, I didn't end up taking them. But I just, I, I did feel that that was the obvious way to play that. Um, and, you know, when it's minus 190 pre-fight, it was just a clear pass. If you like the Bulgarian side, I felt. Yeah. Also on that, why are we giving him a pass, man? Why are you going into a fight? Did you not watch tape against, you know, for C-Rod? Did you not see that he was like composed and durable? Why are you going all out like you're fucking crushing cans on the regional scene? Why aren't you pacing yourself? You know, why aren't you fighting with composure yourself? Like he's going out like full retard in round one. It just wasn't good. Um, wasn't good tactics, man, by him. So... Well, I, I think he thought he had that finish with, with the Peruvian necktie. Um, yeah, honestly, so, it, it was a weird it was a that. weird grip sequence, but, dude, he had him in a, in a pretty tough spot there. Um, but C-Rod, man, I've just been so impressed by this guy. You know, Rich, what I take pride in is I picked against him his last three fights, and I had the sense that God gave geese to not bet these guys against him just because I was like, I respect this guy too much, right? I've only bet on him one time. It was against Reyes Cortez, minus 190. I was like, D he's not losing this fight. But, like, these other fights, I've just felt like, man, he's missing weight. Like, could this be a problem? He just keeps finding solutions. And uh, Anthony Pettis has has pegged this guy as the next world champion from Rufus Sport, and they're going to invest in him heavily. So, he's, man, good, he, he's just a really hard guy to deal with. I'd like to see him back at 35, Rich, but maybe he's just too big for it now. He, he did look pretty big at the faceoff. All right. Let's go, man. All right, good stuff, man. Let's get into it. I know what you guys are waiting for. You're waiting for this first fight of the night. We got Mohamed Usman taking on Mick Parkin. And this is a fight, Rich, that uh, I don't feel much of a need to get involved in. But I have made some money along the way with Mohamed Usman's underdog trend. He's been coming through in these spots. I, I felt like people give him too much grief because, like, yeah, he's not Kamaru, but this isn't welterweight. He doesn't need to be. right. He just needs to be okay, and he'll beat some of these guys. Um, especially the really low level ones. So for me, this is a spot where I don't think of Mick Parkin as, as low level as some of these past opponents, but I also don't really know what I have with Mick Parkin. So do I feel the need to invest in a chalk price at heavyweight? I mean, not really. I feel like Mick Parkin looked okay in his last fight, but he was like a huge favorite. Didn't really impress me that much. Kyle Machado is not a guy that I think is destined for, you know, the top of the division. So uh, that's how I felt about it, Rich, but it's not a fight I feel particularly compelled to invest in. For me, in the heavyweight division, more often than not, it's a dogger pass situation. Muhammad Usman, I feel like, has a little bit more marketing potential uh, at this time. So those are some of my thoughts, but he's also a little bit older. His skills aren't really there, uh, and he's gassed out in the past and given up um, against, who is that, Brandon Sales? Not a great look. So uh, how do you feel about this one? Yeah, tough to place a bet on either of these guys, man. I, I am surprised to see Usman is the underdog still holding the plus 120 price tag um, considering um, Parkin is coming in, short notice, travel as well from the UK. Um, you know, the media side on Usman's quite big, man. Um, I'm surprised to see him as like the opener. He was due to fight Barnett. Um, that was a layup spot for him. I would have bet him big there if I got a decent price, but in this one, I still say Usman is the side. It's going to be some cage pushing, some calf kicks, some uh, some jabs, you know, measuring distance, then not throwing anything. Just some typical heavyweight bullshit. Probably goes the distance. Um, and I'll take Usman by more cage pushing and more, more better visual optics, I guess. So I guess he's the side, but nothing I want any part of, man. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel as well. You know, I think I'm going to end up with a, probably reluctant pick in the article on Muhammad Usman and probably not bet my money on this fight. Um, yeah. But next up, we got a, a compelling matchup here. Two undefeated fighters, Igor Severino and Andre Lima. You want to start us off, Rich? 
Yeah, another fight I'm not too high on, to be honest. Um, I can't bet this kid who's 20 coming in, making his debut, all jungle fights, um, low opposition. Um, he's got some decent submissions from shoot box. He's going to have good cardio. I suspect like many fighters on this card, they're both on the juice. Um, I'd worry about betting Lima just because I think um, Savinio is going to be there for the full three rounds. I don't think Lima's going to get him out of there. He's too low volume. Uh, he's primarily a striker. Apparently, he's a black belt, but I haven't witnessed any of that in his fights, so I don't know how legit that black belt is. Um, so, yeah, I'll go Lima. Probably a decision. Um, Savinio, he does have bad takedown defense. I have seen people um, play in his guard, and um, they pretty much just let him up or... You know, the rounds ended, then he's fucked him up. So, yeah, he's too young, man. Um, haven't seen enough from him. So, I got Lima, probably decision, man, but I'm not too high on this fight. Yeah, Rich, this is something that, you know, it, it's kind of like a fundamental way that I think about these fights where it's like, I, I think of an age advantage when one guy's 35 and another guy's 27. I think of an age disadvantage when one guy's 25 and the other guy's 20. You know, and it's just because you're not physically developed fully as a male, typically until 25 years of age, right? Your body changes, you get a little bit stronger, you, you start to fill out. And some of those things probably haven't happened yet. Um, you know, whereas Lima, I feel like it's just a little bit more physical. I think his musculature is a little bit more uh, serious at this point, you know, for whatever that's worth. And I just feel like he's a little bit more technical on the feet as well. So he's probably going to make fewer mistakes here. I don't think he's as likely to adrenaline dump. Um, you know, I think we might see a guy come out with a, a big grappling pace early and then start to slow down a little bit. So, um, you know, this is a fight where I'm, I'm probably going to also let this one go because my lean is the minus 180 favorite. And these guys are both 25 years of age, 20 years of age, not guys that I feel like I can rely on um, at this point. But I feel like Mascate uh, is also the bigger social media side in this one. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if he gets the job done here in a close decision. Yep. Next up, uh, what do we got? Rendon. Rendon. Um, oh my goodness. This is not a very high level fight in my view. Um, I like it, man. Hey, then take us away, Rich. I have literally yeah. no opinion on this fight. <laughs> Yeah, so it's funny, man. I watched tape on <clears throat> the Russian chick first, and you can go and watch this fight on YouTube. It's against a girl called Sutova, uh, with a Z, uh, Zutova. And this Zutova chick was taking her down, mauling her for like a round, round and a half. And then out of nowhere, the Russian chick, I can't pronounce her name, so she's getting called the Russian chick. So this Russian chick. Daria. Reverse, Daria, I think. Yeah. That's a good Whatever. one. <laughs> yeah, she reverses and finishes her. But to me, I was like, there's no way I can bet this Russian girl. A takedown defense sucks. Um, this is a bad look, etc. And then I watched like some more of her most recent fights. And I'm getting the vibe, man. She's like a mirror image of um, Firo, Maron Firo. She trains at the MMA factory in France, as does Firo. And they have a similar style, man. They got strong punches. They like to keep it standing on the feet. In my opinion, again, they're both on fucking the juice. They're both on steroids. I think that um, MMA factory is notorious for that, their fighters. And she's got a good sprawl, man. So it's obvious what she wants to do in this fight. Keep it on the feet and then light up Rendon on the feet. Um, and I think she's going to do it, man. I don't like the money line price tag minus 200. I think that's getting a bit out of line. But I'm interested in the ITD. I'm interested in round one. And I'm interested in the KO for this Russian girl. And that's simply because Rendon, she's 35. Her UFC debut was bullshit against um, Vidal, I think it was. And it was just a piss poor showing, man. Like, she took Vidal down twice, but it was off kicks, lazy kicks from Vidal. I think Vidal was in autopilot mode after round one. She was a bit gassed. You know, she was puffing in there. And Rendon, man, everything's labored from her. Her striking, her footwork, everything's slow. Um, she doesn't gauge distance well. She doesn't have the wrestling, in my opinion, to take the Russian girl down. So I think she's literally going to get lit up on the feet. This girl has got some good striking, powerful punches. And, um, yeah, she's going to get her out of there, man. I don't think she's going to like it. She's going to bloody her up, um, make her turn her back, 
crumble on the floor, maybe even sink in a choke, you know, some type of club and sub. But I'll go for the Russian girl to get it done, ITD. And uh, we're fader next time, man, with someone who can actually wrestle. Um, but yeah, Russian chick for the win, man. Yeah, 57% of topology votes on the plus, uh, what is it now? Plus 180 underdog, what could go wrong? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yeah, a lot yeah, of people are picking topology. Rendon, so uh, probably because she's got the UFC experience. And I mean, we've we've seen stunts before in uh, UFC debuts, but I would tend to agree. There's a more marketable side here, younger fighter, so this makes a little bit more sense. Next up, we got Stephen Wynn, the king of the contender series, uh, against Jarno Ahrens, a um, guy who's really struggled so far in the UFC. Um, a lot of people are picking Stephen Wynn to get the job done this weekend. Uh, I'll be honest with you, Rich. I feel like his level of competition on the contender series was extremely low. Um, you know, AJ Cunningham, not a guy uh, that has proven himself to be UFC level yet, right? He's in the organization. He took the beating from Ludovic Klein to get that foot in the door, as you like to say. But, you know, that was a, a pretty tough look for him there. As for the Theo fight, I mean, that guy was like comically undersized and looked like he was like afraid to engage in that fight um, a little bit. So I, I wasn't really impressed by those wins. Um, the Alon Cruz fight was like a crazy fight. And I think that's why they brought him back because they were like, man, brutal way to have it, you know, taken away from you is a, a fight where he was winning, um, you know, a close fight. And then Alon Cruz knocked him out. So I think that this is a spot where, um, you know, they tried to give him a winnable fight. You know, Jarno Ahrens is a guy that struggled, but he mixes up his game a little bit more. Um, you know, he seems to rock people with his counter shots pretty frequently, doesn't follow up um, very effectively, but I think that's maybe something he could fix over time. Um, you know, he's still getting his feet wet. William Gomez is a guy that's proven hard to fight for a number of people with bad footwork in the UFC. You know, they kind of just chase him around and he makes it a, a hard thing to land any shots on him that matter. Um, but he did have that one submission attempt that was close. So he's come close to finishing both these fights. He just didn't have great finishing instincts. Um, he does seem a little bit like a popular underdog this week uh, among my circle. So uh, it's something I'll look into a little bit closer on tape, whether I trust him to get some grappling going here and try and mix it up. But I don't really trust Stephen Wynn uh, as, as this kind of favorite price tag. Um, I would be more interested in looking at an under potentially and hoping that one of these guys makes a critical error uh, and falls apart. How do you feel, Rich? Yeah, I really want to bet Aaron's, to be honest. Um, I definitely think he's the size here. And I don't know whose dick fucking um, win has been sucking, man. He gets free opportunities on Dana White Contender Series. He gets brought into the UFC after, you know, underachieving there. And um, yeah, he's 30 years old, so... He's obviously doing some favors for somebody, man. Um, I don't think he's that great to what you were saying. You know, he fought that um, Thailand guy, whatever his name was. He was 5-0. and oh. There was a clear advantage in the grappling there. He didn't push it. Even when it got forced, you know, into some grappling positions and he had, you know, an advantageous positions. He just didn't go back to it, man. It's like he's got no second gear. All his win wants to do is stay at range, throw the calf kick. And, you know, throw some one-twos and see what the opposition is going to give him. And I, I don't like that, man. The only reason that I'm not betting Aaron's and the only thing that's stopping me is the calf kicks. Um, we seen Choi hit the calf kicks on Aaron's. He wasn't checking them. And in round three, he was done. Choi was just a retard, followed him to the ground, should have let him back up. One more kick and the ref would have called the fight off. So, um, yeah, it's the calf kicks of win that I'm worrying about. You know, I can see me betting on Aaron's. It's some sparring match type shit. And then round two, you know, you can hear Mike Bisping or fucking Joe Rogan say, that, that calf's dead. It's gone. Is it the peruvial nerve or whatever the fuck that word is um, that they like to mention so much? Um, but I like Aaron's, man. He's got the power. We've seen that against uh, Max Koger on the regional scene, one shot um, KO. Um, we saw Win get knocked out before against the guy, Alan Cruz, like you said. And Alan Cruz isn't up to much. He was getting pieced up in that fight. You know, 20 seconds left, and he finds some fucking mad flying knee shit. So, um, yeah, I think Wynn's a bit of an idiot, man. Bit of low IQ. I think he's going to give Aaron's all the chance to find something in this fight. Um, I think Aaron's has got fast hands. He's unpredictable. He's got the jiu-jitsu on his side if it goes there. So, yeah, Aaron's at underdog price is uh, the side, in my opinion. I just don't know whether I'm personally going to get to a bet. Um but yeah, KO would interest me on the Aaron side, man. 
I think he's the one with power. Or maybe either by KO. I'd imagine you can get that at plus 200, something like that. That would be a good look in this fight. But yeah, that, yeah we're seeing this fight. one the same way. I, I just think both these guys, you know, give some openings. And the way I would see Win, you know, getting the stoppage here would be an accumulation, right? Like if he can just deal with the power and throw, you know, he throws an incredible amount of strikes over the course of his fight. So I think that's his path. But yeah, he's not a guy that's going to hit you with one shot and put you down typically. So that's going to give a counter puncher chances, you know, and that's when you're betting on a puncher's chance, look for that prop, the knockout, it's going to be a better payout. Um, yeah. the ITE, um, cause I, I do think Aaron's is, is kind of destined to be screwed if this goes to decision, unless he's grappling heavy, he just does not throw enough. He kind of gasses out over the course of 15 minutes. So maybe he'll have addressed that, right? With the absence of USADA, people just putting up numbers, right? Shout out to the OSP betters. <laughs> a couple of people were, were out there, uh, you know, putting receipts in the chat. Hey, God bless you for it. This man came back ready to party. And uh, I think a lot of other people are going to do that um, in the UFC in the near future. So something to be weary of. But with that being said, man, we can move along to this next fight. We got Miles Johns taking on Cody Gibson. Speaking of, um, you know, people that may or may not be uh, rocking with the fact that USADA is not here no more. Uh, we've got, you know, one half of a picture with Trey Ogden and Miles Johns. These guys looked like they were having great workout sessions, you know, that eating all their celery, everything like that. Um, so just something to keep in mind, right? Um, Miles Johns does look to have uh, the superior, you know, athleticism, the superior musculature among these athletes. Um, you know, when I look at Cody Gibson, he's a guy that's fun, you know, uh, but he did give me some red flags in his interview. Right. And he's talking about, I, I want to go out there. I want to push the pace. I want to get in his face. And, um, you know, I, I want to, you know, create a lot of exchanges and stuff. And I was just like, that sounds like a bad idea early in this fight because Miles Johns, I just think is a little bit more explosive. Like, am I ever going to bet Miles Johns is a favorite in the UFC? Zero percent. That's not something I do. Um, I think I faded him twice in the UFC. Um, and when I look at Miles Johns, um, he has some skills, but I also feel like, you know, he's been a little bit fortunate at times in the UFC. If you look back, Anderson Dos Santos, I think, was a little bit underqualified at the time. Um, Kevin Natividad, you know, he cheated to end that fight. You know, let's just call a spade a spade. He, like, held his glove and then just threw an uppercut from a Hades. Um, and, you know, he had no chance to defend it, got absolutely starched there. So, uh, brutal shot. He was going to win the fight anyway. But I think Miles is a little bit more athletic. I think he's a little bit more well-equipped here. Um, so I, I'm probably going to, um, you know, look maybe to take violence in this spot because Cody Gibson says, I'm going to come forward. I'm going to swing like crazy. I'm going to get in his face. He said, I, I want to be like Michael Chandler. I'm not here for a good, uh, a long time. I'm here for a good time. Okay. He's like, I got a baby at home. I got to get out of there quick. Like he's got, is like my wife's due any minute. I'm like, all right. So I'm just like, I'm either going to bet the under or the fight not to go and just move on. Uh, how do you feel? Um, yeah, I like the Miles John side. Like I didn't see the interview with Cody Gibson, but it's unsurprising, man. That's how the guy fights. Um, I remember when he fought Ray Borg in that Eagle FC and I had Ray Borg pre-fight and Cody was putting it on him in round one, man. I think he won round one and I was sweating a bit, but then Gibson does what he does, man. He, he fell off, um, started getting wrestle fucked, got took down and almost got finished in round three. He's never been KO'd. He likes to get submitted. I think that Miles John's submission 2-3 is a good look and it's at a good price. I've just seen fight doesn't go the distance is plus 120. Um, I didn't expect that, so I might look at that. But yeah, Cody, man, he, um, in his debut against um, Brad Katona, I had Katona quite heavy and I had Katona ITD, even though Katona isn't a finish. That's just how you know little I value Gibson and his game, man. I don't like it. He's hittable. Um, very hittable. And I think one of these punches from um, Johns could put him down and then he could like jump on the neck or something. Um, yeah, he's just not smart, man. Gauging distance, footwork and stuff. And that was the problems with Johns versus Castaneda. Johns just wasn't able to find him, man. Castaneda was in and out, making him swing and miss, making him tired. And then obviously eventually got the finish. But Gibson isn't about that, man. He's 36 school teacher talking bullshit in his interviews which i wasn't aware of but i like even more now so john's is the side i guess the numbers where it's at for john's minus 140 is because of the time off 
the USADA suspension and the rest of it. But make no mistake, man, you, you can sugarcoat it a little bit or be kind to them. They're both juiced as fuck. So is Ogden. So is half the people on this card. Um, it's evident from their physique, man, if you've been watching UF, um, MMA for a while. So, um, yeah, give me Miles Johns, man. I think he's the side for sure. And a finish. I think it's a good look. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with uh, your general outlook. I'm, I'm very surprised that it's uh, plus money. I did not expect to see that. So that's very interesting to me. And um, uh, So, yeah, someone saying in the chat, Johns is low volume. He is, but Gibson isn't going to give him that opportunity, man. He's literally going to bum rush him, um, get in his face and make him fight. So, you know, he ain't going to have a choice. You either fire back or you get finished in round one. And, yeah, he's going to fire back, man. So it's going to make for fireworks. I love that take. Love that take. Um, I am trying to bet it as we speak. But with that being said, my brother, we can move along to this next fight where we've got Ricardo Ramos taking on Julian Arosa. And I think I started the last one. Why don't you start us off after I just quickly acknowledge our brother, Cashville Reek, and says favorite underdog on the card from each of you. Hit the like button. Subscribe to the channels. I, I only have one play on this card. The line has moved a little bit. I, I must acknowledge um, you know, but I, I was definitely looking interested in that use of Salal side. Uh, we'll talk about it more when we get to that point in the card, but that's my favorite underdog on the card, brother. Um, and I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the sentiments and I want to just shout you out there. Cashville Reekin, a brother from another. Thank you for the support. Uh, now, Rich, why don't you go ahead and start us off on this Ricardo Ramos matchup, brother? Yeah, so again, man, like many fights on the card, I can make a case for either guy. I wouldn't be surprised with either guy winning the fight. Um, you know, that's like a lot of bites in, in this one. And the way I see this is Ramos can only win this fight. Well, not can only, but in my opinion, he will only win this fight by decision. So if you like Ramos, decision 325 is a good look. And on the Erosa side, take your pick. Could be sub, could be a KO by attrition, um, you know, Ranks two, three. Um, but yeah, I guess if I had to lean away, I'm going Ramos by decision, man. I think Erosa's chin issues are not overstated, but I just, you know, in this one, I think he's going to be fine, man. Ramos, he likes some spinning shit that catches people off guard. I don't think he's going to land one of them in this fight. You know, his hands aren't that great outside of some spinning shit. You know, he's usually a takedown guy, looks for a submission. I think that's what he's going to go for, for here. Um, Eros is decent off his back. He will play guard a little bit, throw up triangles and whatnot. Um, but his takedown defense is half decent, man. So it's a tough one to call. I can see him round two or three. Um, Ramos getting tired a little bit. He just stick his neck out a bit and he's being guillotined a few times. So I think Erosa could snatch up his neck, you know, guillotine, dash choke, whatever it may, may be. But then also, it could be a TKO, man. You know, Eros has got the better cardio, in my opinion. He's got the metrics on his side. And, um, yeah, that's the way I'd look at this fight. Uh, another thing I'd say is the Padilla KO on Erosa. No hate on the ref, man. I'm not saying it was a, a stupidly, um, you know, a um, a quick stoppage. But I'd have give Erosa some more chance there, you know. Um, I don't think Padilla put him out, out. But that's even near or there, or whatever the fucking saying is, but I just think Erosa's chin issues are overstated, man. If you're betting Ramos by KO, I wouldn't do it, in my opinion. Um, I like Ramos by decision, man. Yeah, I think... Um, I, I do believe that Julian Erosa has real chin issues, man. <laughs> I, I gotta just start there. And, and the reason I say that is because, um, you know, I remember... Before the Alex Caceres fight, people were like, bro, there's no way Alex Caceres could knock him out. And I was like, are we sure about that? Like, he throws, like, a kicks. He throws, like, punches. He, he really throws hard. Is there – are we sure? And then he knocked him out um, in crazy fashion. Uh, do I think we're going to see that kind of explosive kicking game from Ricardo Ramos? No, I do not. But I do just think, like, We've seen it so many times, and even against low-level opponents, right? Like on the regional scene against guys with negative records, he's still been knocked out in those fights. So I think it's always there. But in terms of controlling what he can control, he's an excellent fighter. 
right? Like he does have real skills. He can throw his own shots. I think his defense does leave something to be desired on the feet, but I think that on the ground, you know, he's not an easy guy to take advantage of. What's ironic is like, he's even been dropped in fights. I think the the Woodson fight, he gets dropped and gets back up and submits him. You know, he just like, he's such an energizer bunny that he can keep getting up. He can keep moving. He can keep pressing, but he can also just be clipped on the button. And uh, I do think Ramos is kind of a sniper with the elbows. Like it's a really ridiculous thing to be good at. But it's also just like it's what he it's what he's got. Like he could just snipe people with that. Um, my boy, I didn't he catch my boy Eamon? Um, you know, so I think this is a guy. Um, he's still young in the game, uh, which sounds crazy, but 28 years of age, you know, he still could be making some developments. Um, and he's got a lot of finishes, you know, he can mix in the grappling. He uh got a decision win against Bill Algeo, who's another black belt. Um, so I think it's an interesting spot here, but yeah, to your point, maybe there could be value on the decision because people don't expect it. And uh, Arosa is a pretty tough guy, but I could see him getting out positioned, out grappled here, um, personally. So it's an interesting spot. But what I will tell you, and I'll leave you guys with this: uh, Julian Arosa has one of the best underdog trends, um, you know, that I've seen in a while. It's like four and four is a dog for a 77% ROI. I mean, if you just system bet this guy is an underdog, you're making money. So uh, for whatever that's worth. Next up, we've got Trey Ogden. Speaking of, uh, you know, juice against uh, Kurt Holliba. And this is a spot with Kurt where, um, you know, he, he was dealt from the bottom of the deck when he first came to the UFC, but now he's 37 years of age, you know? Uh, yeah. You got to deal with where you're at right now. And he did seem to struggle um, in a couple of his recent fights, right? Uh, the Hubbard fight, he was able to get to his win condition. You know, he's able to break him down. Um, but some of the losses for Hubbard have an age great. And, uh, you know, he, he it was the same way he's been typically getting beat, right? Like somebody just out grappling uh, Hubbard systematically. And I think that when I'm looking at this spot, um, this is an interesting one because I, I have seen Trey Ogden get out grappled and put in bad situations, but now he's looking strong. He's very awkward to strike with on the feet. We've seen that against a number of guys. And it's interesting to see him installed here as a favorite for the first time in the UFC, right? He's been a dog every time out. Now they're favoring him uh, at the betting window in advance of this contest. And uh, I do think that's an interesting note, but I also don't think that Kurt Holobaugh is a proven guy uh, as a dog, you know, like he did it last time. That was a nice win, but you know, the other times he's been an underdog in the UFC, they were dead on, you know, he should have been a dog and he lost the fight. So uh, it's an interesting fight because I think Kurt is a guy that goes out there with nothing to lose, right? He goes out there and fights like a dog, throws crazy, has power, has submission ability. So he's a dangerous fighter, but he's a little bit older. And I think that the guy who's probably more uh, apt to make the right technical decisions for 15 minutes is probably Trey Ogden. But I think he's a less dangerous guy, so I don't want to invest in the chalk price. Uh, how do you feel about this one, Rich? Yeah, I kind of agree with everything you said, man. Um, what I noticed from tape is Kurt's takedown defense is super ugly, super bad, man. Like, it's just the worst. Um, so I think the takedowns are going to be there all day for Ogden. And then on the other side, the only thing I don't like about Ogden is his stand-up, man. I think it's pretty disgusting. I think he's purely a jiu-jitsu guy looking to, uh, you know, bounce around on the feet and just time a takedown um, in the majority of the fights I've seen him in. Um, so, the, yeah, them takedowns will be there, man. But I do worry on the feet, you know, Kurt, um, he does throw with power. He does throw combinations. I can easily see him getting a KO. Um, I was surprised at the KO line for Kurt. It was a plus three, no, plus 650. Um, I think that's pretty wild. Um, I think he can stay safe on the ground. I think Ogden's going to win a decision most likely unless uh, Kurt catches him on the feet. But plus 650 for the KO has definitely got my attention, man. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm going to snatch that up or stay away, but I won't be taking Ogden by decision um, just because, man, Kurt's got that 15 minutes to land something. Um, and he tires in fights. Ogden, I've noticed that. Yeah, he's on the juice, but, you know, it's not jiu-jitsu, man. It's MMA and... Um, yeah, punches matter, man. I can see him. I can see his cardio failing him. The fight against Jordan Levitt wasn't a good look, uh, especially round three. So, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with that fight, man. Nothing too in-depth there. Yeah, I just don't feel great about this fight. You know, like, it does feel to me like 
a lot of people are are picking Kurt Hollibaugh outright. They think he's going to win this fight. Um, you know, there there's some ultimate fighters, um, you know, on this fight card. Maybe they're being highlighted. You know, there's a couple things to think about there. But I just don't feel great about this one, man. Last time out, you know, Ogden kind of got jobbed, right? Like it was complete bullshit. So I don't know if they're trying to do him a favor. I don't know if they're just like, screw this guy. I, I really don't know what to make of it all. Um, so it's not a fight I feel very comfortable putting my money on at this stage. Uh, and I do think this is a tricky fight card, right? I think there's live underdogs throughout, but it's like, where do you want to invest your money? You know, and, and for me, I want to just make sure I'm putting it, uh, you know, in proven commodities if I can. And I feel like these are both guys that are, you know, on the back end of their career, you know, in terms of age. And, you know, I just don't know exactly what to expect from these guys over 15 minutes. I, like I said, I think Kurt's a little more dangerous, but. Uh, as Sicky does, as Kurt can get taken down by Augusta Wind. I mean, I do think that's yeah. something to watch out for here. And I always would rather have the guy who's in top position because, like, throwing up stuff off your back, it's, it's pretty low percentage, especially at the UFC level. But with that yeah. being said, my man, we can move to this next fight uh, where Luis Pauejo is taking on Fernando Padilla. Why don't you start us off here, Rich? Um, so, yeah, in short, I like Padilla. Uh, only by submission, though. I don't think you should be playing his money line, and I don't think he's going to get a KO. I think the KO against Arosa was, you know, a little bit of a combination between Arosa's chin and the ref stopping it early. Um, ordinarily, though, I don't think he's got good hands, um, but that's just my take. The submissions plus 700. He's my um, prop of the week. Last week, it was Brian Battle by submission. We didn't get to see that. So hopefully Padilla kicks off the prop of the week shit and, um, you know, we get that going. And I think this is a binary fight, man. I can't pronounce the other guy's name coming off Dana White contender series. So we're calling him the Peru guy. Is he from Peru? Have I got that right? At least. Paolo. Yeah, Paolo. Um, so yeah, yeah Paolo. <laughs> I think he's a stand-up guy. Um, pressure, um, pace, boxing, likes his hands, doesn't throw many kicks. And I think he's going to put it on Padilla, man, and make him fight. Um, I don't like Padilla's, um, you know, lack of volume, the way he just plugs along in the ring, doesn't cut people off. The uh, Kyle Nelson fight was obviously concerning, especially as a minus 250 favorite. But this Paolo guy, he hasn't got that kind, kind of footwork. He's not going to avoid the fight like Kyle Nelson did. So I think, you know, this is going to make for action. And I saw the interview with Padilla. He said that he's going to mix up his game, which to me says he's going to mix in takedowns, hopefully, and, um, you know, finally use his submission game. Um, so, yeah, that's the way I'm attacking it, man. I'll take the plus 700, put half a unit on it, and see what happens, man. That's the way I, I want to take some action on this fight. Fair play, my man. Uh, I do think that the grappling is unproven. Um, and what we have seen has not looked very promising from Paolo. But what I will say is a great nickname for him, the Corazon de Leon. This is a guy who's got heart. He wants to fight, not afraid to get hit. Um, his losses are by split decision, right? Um, he fights pretty damn hard. And so I think that, you know, you made a great point, right? Maybe the way to invest on Padilla, you look for a prop that you like. But he's a guy where, you know, I feel like we don't have a great resume from him so far in the UFC level. You know, Kyle Nelson is a guy that was on the verge of being cut a few fights ago, right? Then he found the right supplement plan and he found the right weight class and everything. And, and he started to have some better results. But when you look um, at what Padilla has produced, you know, do I think that he has more skills that he could try and mix in here? Yes. Um, but do I, do I trust that he can necessarily finish this guy uh, at the highest clip? So look like beyond, like you said, the submission you think could happen, but the KO, it'd be hard to imagine on this Buello guy. He takes hammers to the face and he looks like he's willing to keep walking through the fire. So I don't think he's a guy that's likely to quit on you, um, but he might just be outgunned and outskilled here in his first UFC fight. So uh, it's an interesting matchup, but not one that I feel like betting at this point. Um, yeah. Anything to some, add? Of, oh, some other things to mention, man. Padilla, he's never been finished. Um, I understand what you're saying, man, but I know that this. Paolo guy is going to go full rabies in round one. You know, his, it's his UFC debut. They've put him on the main card. Is it the main card? Have we got there yet? Um, I think this is the first fight on the main card. Yes, it is. It's going to be opening it up. Yeah. 
that's a big ask, man. Putting this fucking Dana White contender series bum on, on the main card, you know, he's definitely going to get the UFC jitters. That doesn't bode well. I might even hit Padilla sub one and two or so, depending on the numbers. Um, so, yeah, he's going to yeah, bring subs the subs are substantially bit. more likely in rounds one and two, uh, just because yeah. of the sweat. <laughs> Yeah, and the metrics as well on the Padilla side, six one seven six is a big fucker, man. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at, man. Submission all day. Fair enough, my man. Next up, we've got Billy Quarantillo taking on Yusuf Salal, and I'll start off here. Uh, I did mention, uh, you know, before when my guy asked uh, Cashville Rican asked for my favorite underdog on the card, and and right now my favorite underdog on the card is Yusuf Salal, and listen. I'm a proud New Yorker. I got the Ohio State shirt on. You know, if I rep for two states, it's New York and Ohio. But when you're talking about um, this fight, I look at the on-paper intangibles, and it screams to me that I should be betting use of the law as a system play in this kind of opportunity. And the reason I say that is because, number one, he's going to have a reach advantage in this contest. Um, he's also the much younger athlete here and people, you know, I've heard people break down this fight, Rich, and it was ironic to me. Um, but I, I heard a couple of people break down this fight, even people I respect. And they're like, man, this guy was 0 three in the UFC. Uh, you know, uh, and I'm like, excuse me. No, 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 you guys missed it. No, he had a bunch of other fights before that. So he went on a brutal, uh, run in the UFC and, he has been outlanded rich in like one of his UFC fights. So like, this is a guy that fought Ilya Taporia and like outlands him on significant strikes. I'm not saying he won the fight, right? He lost the fight, obviously, but like, he's not a guy that's easy to hit. Whereas Billy Quarantillo is a very easy guy to hit. Everybody hits him as many times as they want, right? He's a very tough guy. He's a very tough man. Uh, he's a skilled guy. He's a great martial artist, but he's 35 years of age in a pretty unforgiving division. And the weight cuts don't get any easier the older you get. Um, when you get knocked out by an Enzo Barboza and completely flatlined, you know, this is a guy that's alternated wins and losses since 2020. And he's fought a high level of competition, but I haven't always been blown out of, you know, he was supposed to go out there and pace um, with Shane Burgos, right? And then what ended up happening, he got exhausted. And so the what he was throwing had no impact, right? Shane was willing to take, you know, the little pitter patters because he was slamming him with shots and hitting him with the calf kicks and throwing more than he was. So the the pace game that he tries to play, I think is going to open up counter shots for Zalal. Something that really impressed me, man, is like Demond Blackshear is a good fighter. He's lost to some good fighters in the UFC, but he has skills. You know, like he's a guy that has um, a quality ground game. He gave Farid Basharat good exchanges on the mat. And when I look at this guy, and how he was able to hurt him so bad in round three and rally and get the draw there. Like Yusuf Zalal does seem to have some intangibles, right? He's a guy that can push hard into round three. We saw that against Ilya. We saw that against, um, you know, Demond Blackshear. So it's like, I've seen some pretty good things from him. And at 27, around Brandon Royval and around these guys, he's training around UFC level fighters every day. Is he not supposed to get a little bit better over time? He's still young and can make improvements and he's in his prime. So I'm getting an in his prime use of Salal against a Billy Quarantillo that I feel like is naturally like, like every other human being starting to deteriorate in terms of his age and his ability to take damage. So I feel like we saw shades of that in the Damon Jackson fight and he was able to outlast him on cardio. He was able to push harder, but Damon Jackson is an, an age contemporary. He's another gentleman who's in his mid to late thirties, I believe. So I just, I, I'm not seeing the same kind of pace, um, you know, advantage that some other people are seeing. So it's a great, uh, it's a great fight. Uh, I like Billy, fun guy, New Yorker. If he wins, what can I do but take my hat off to him? But I feel like Yusuf Zala at plus 125 was a no-brainer for me, Rich. Had to have that. Yeah, I like him, Zalal too, man. Um, and to your guy who donoed, man, I guess I'll go with Aaron's as my underdog pick, because being as you've already got Zalal. Um, but yeah, man, I don't listen to any other podcasts, to be honest. The first time I did was the other week when um, Benoit was fighting Poirier, because I had some painting to do, so I had time to kill. But I don't think there are any sharp people outside of me and you on, on fucking Twitter. So I don't listen to the noise, man. I can imagine everyone's like, um, this line's crazy. I don't understand it. Um, and everyone's betting Billy Q, you know, based on Zalal's record, 
getting cut from the UFC, short notice. Billy's a beast. He's going to put it on him in round two and three, but... I ain't buying it, man. Um, I think Zalao is going to be safe everywhere. I think his lateral movement is going to be a problem for Billy. I don't think Billy's going to be able to find him. I think he's got the cardio to match Billy, even though it's short notice. I think he stays ready. I think he was getting ready for tough not too long ago. He's at a good gym. He's always helping people out. I've seen him at other fighters' um, fights, you know, as the cornerman. So I think he's always in the game. Um, one thing that concerned me is the fact that he's Muslim. Obviously, it's Ramadan. You don't see many Muslims fighting. But I watched his interview with James Lynch, and it turns out he's a fake Muslim. He's not going to be fasting. He's throwing it out the window because he's fighting, so he's making allowances for that. So I don't think the fasting thing, you know, that's going to be a thing. That would have concerned me betting on, on him. Um, the only other thing that concerns me is the fact that he's fucking drinking the uh, juice from the Macy Barber Cup, apparently. They're an item. Um, so, yeah, take that for what it's worth. But she's a huge distraction. I don't like to see that. But, um, yeah, in terms of this fight, man, I don't see what Billy's going to do. Billy has to break him. He's not going to break him. Billy's 35. Um, you know, he walks forward a bit, you know, with no caution. I've watched both, both their interviews. Billy's talking about um, he's got him covered everywhere pretty much. Um, he says he's got an advantage over Zalao. I don't see it, to be honest. And then on the Zalao side, he keeps referencing the Tapora fight. Yeah, it was a good cap, you know, for him, the fact that he didn't get finished and it was competitive. Um, but yeah, I don't like that, man. Living in the past, like going on about some fight that was like three, four years ago or whatever, just move on, in it. But yeah, in terms of the fight, man, how can you not play Zalao at dog money, man? He's good everywhere. He's a black belt himself. The only thing that would worry me on the Billy side is that he pulls up some fluky submission, some triangle, some armbar, but Zalao's never been finished. So I've got to believe that's low percentage and not going to happen. Uh, I'm quite big on Zalao, man. So I might even put, you know, a quarter of a unit on Billy by submission. Um, something small, man, just to cover me in case Zalao does lose by submission. But my final take is Billy can only win by an opportunistic submission and Zalal's got him covered everywhere and Zalal's going to make it look easy, man. So, yeah, I like Zalal a lot. Uh, yeah, man, I do too. Um, you know, I, I bet I bet he's, um, you know, uh, practicing, you know, uh, more more stringently uh, outside of this time. But, hey, man, for our for the sake of our bets – I want him to just do whatever. Hey, whatever makes you comfortable. If you would be better fasting, then fast. If you would be better not fasting, don't fast. That's all. No, bro. This time, we need him to just focus on our mission, <laughs> and then he can do whatever he's doing. No, man. Bro, uh, that's let all. me reference that because I don't want people, Muslims, to come hating on, on me. I'm not even a religious person at all. I'd say I'm atheist, if anything, but each to their own. You can't. Hey, it's atheist acknowledgement Muslim. day. It's atheist acknowledgement day on uh, Saturday, Rich. So <laughs> is that right? You get yeah, yeah. So there you go. You, <laughs> we're acknowledging yeah. you. You can't call yourself a Muslim, and then when these practices come up, to you, oh, I'll do it next week, or I don't feel like it, man. Um, if I was religious, you know, you got to be devoted to that shit, man. You can't just brush it off, whether it's fight night or what. He shouldn't have accepted the fight. Bilal Muhammad does it. He's fought through Ramadan before, so. You either go 100% or you don't go at all, in my opinion. No excuses, man. But, yeah, it's nice for our fight in it. So do what, yeah, do what you want, When man. your name is Bilal, remember the name Muhammad? You're all in, bro. You're all in. <laughs> Funny. Uh, and, dude, literally Yusuf Salah's nickname is the Moroccan devil. Brain, brain melt. Brain melt. All right. <laughs> We're on to the next one. We got Peyton Talbot taking on Cameron Simon. Um, fantastic matchup. Uh, and we know that Rich has a lot to say about this one because it was already posted on his Twitter. So if you're not following him over on X, make sure you're doing that at Just Win Baby. Uh, what is that? Two T's? Go yeah. on and tell yeah. what you've got, Rich. <laughs> Yeah, so I put Peyton as the mush of the week. Last week I missed. I put it as Brian, um, no, what's his name? GM as mush of the week. It failed. Is what it is. Can't win them all. My record is amazing on mush of the week. Um, you know, you can go back and look at that. But yeah, Peyton Talbot's mush of the week. I don't choose it. The four horsemen do. Um, 
this is me saying this. Liam doesn't endorse it at all, but Clint's put seven units on the fucker. So I had no choice. I had to put Peyton as the mush of the week. That's how, the rules. That's how we do this thing. Um, the other guys are betting him as well. Everyone and their mom's betting Peyton. Um, apparently he could, um, you know, he could fight Sean O'Malley tomorrow and make it competitive. I've heard somebody say that, mentioning no names. And I just don't get it, man. It's reminded me of Dorgarian, to be honest. Like, everyone's just hyping him up over what? Like, he's had some, you know, sketchy fights on the regional scene. And by that, I mean, it was Uriah Faber's fucking promotion. You know, Uriah's his coach, setting him up with some Ws to get him, um, you know, some wins on his record. And even in them fights, man, he gets taken down. He's got zero defense on the feet. He likes to get hit. Yeah, he walks forward like a zombie, but and he's got a good chin, but you're going to get found out, man. Um, Cortez on the Dana White Contender Series went to decision with him. He did exactly what you need to do. He just fell short. You need to cage push this guy. Um, you know, he takes a minute to, you know, reverse position to get yourself off the cage. I, I'd advise that for Simon in this one. Um, and then, yeah, you go on the Simon side, man. I think this kid's decent, you know. When I made the bet, someone come back at me and said um, they don't like Simon. Um, he looks like a little skinny twink, whatever they call him. He's undersized and the rest of it. He's just a little boy. But to me, in his fights, man, he's shown that he's half decent. He's shown to me that he's on EPO. He's on the steroids down at that fucking South African gym with Duplessis. Um, so I think he can match the cardio of Peyton. I think on the feet, it's going to be competitive. I don't think Peyton's got one punch KO power. It's an accumulation of punches. And I think people get overwhelmed. The cardio fails them, which it's not going to do to Simon. So I can see a competitive fight on the feet. I got dog money. And um, yeah, I'll go Simon by decision, just based on him being able to match the volume, match everything Peyton's going to bring. Um, the only things that are worth mentioning are I watched both interviews, and in my opinion, Simon is dead scared of going to the ground with this guy. He keeps referencing, you know, I hope it stays standing, but if it goes to the ground, I'm fine there. Like, it's just cap, man. It's not true. Simon has a ground deficiency. I've always said that when I've capped his fights. He doesn't like the ground game. He can be controlled there. Um, I just don't think Peyton's going to take advantage, man. I think he's all ego. Um, you know, he's this weird, kooky guy going to fucking Burning Man, playing with his nunchucks, um, trying to be Dennis Rodman-esque. And I don't think he wants any part of the ground. I think he wants to keep it on the feet, maybe drop Simon, you know, do some stupid pose and like wave him on or some shit. And um, yeah, he's not going to show good IQ. If he showed good IQ in this fight, the best thing he could do is wrestle fuck Simon take him down, wear on him, use his size as an advantage and get a submission, man. But I don't believe he's going to do it. Um, and I think you have to cap that in to your fights, man, when you're looking at shit. It's the reason why I max bet MVP, because I didn't think Holland was going to wrestle because he's an idiot, all ego. And I'll be bold enough to say I don't think Peyton's going to do it either. So on the feet, I think it's very competitive. I can't believe people are just so high on this guy after like what? Beat this guy, Nick Aguar, Aguar or whatever it was. Lost round one. Um, it was a pick em after a round. Just craziness, man, from what people are doing here. But whatever. Simon's the side. I like him, man. What are you saying? This is a fascinating fight to me, man. Um, you know, Simon fits some criteria for me. But he, he doesn't fit some of the anthropomorphic advantages. And one of the things I talked about a little bit earlier in the show was we've got a 20 year old taking on a 25 year old. Right. And you can kind of see the physical differences. I feel like between those two guys a little bit. Um, whereas I think that in this one, you know, Simon obviously has musculature, right? Like he looks like he's on the CIT diet and doing everything right. But when you're looking at, um, you know, the Peyton Talbot side, he's a big guy. You know, he's just a big guy for this division. Um, you know, he stands taller than most of his opponents, long, and he throws pretty rangy strikes as well, especially with the boxing range. Um, you know, I do think he can do some damage in this fight uh, while the fight's on the feet. You know, he, he does tend to uh, open himself up for damage as well, right? Like he kind of lives for the exchanges. That could be a problem. He gives away first rounds. That could be a problem um, as, as a, you know, minus 150 favorite. But 
I do think there are some special things about Peyton Talbot. And I'll start with this. You look at Dana White's reaction on the contender series to this guy. And he, he like lost his mind. He's like, this guy is 24 and I can't wait to see what he's like at 27. Like he was just like, like he couldn't say enough glowing things about him. And the reason being is because Peyton is a guy that breaks people. And this is the fighting business, right? And you're trying to make people quit. You're trying to break people down. And I thought that in the Aguirre fight, that was what we would see. So did I rush to the window to lay the, the chalk prices? I did not. But before the fight time, uh, shout out to my guy, Line Mover. He had pushed me, man. He's like, bro, I'm telling you, you're going to live to regret it if you don't even bet those, these round props with it. I'm like, all right, I got to just bet it. And I had the sub. I had the round props. I ended up making you know a lot of money on that fight. And so I don't want to let that bias my opinion on this one. Um, but I do think that you're right about some of the ground efficiencies that we've seen from Simon. You know, he does not seem to have the same technical jujitsu that we've seen from Drickus Duplessis. And I know people will think that I'm crazy for saying that. I know Duplessis sometimes looks a little bit wild in his grappling and he makes some mistakes as well, but he's extremely physical and he does have some really technical passes that he just has the physicality to pull off in a really brutal fashion. So when I look at a guy like Peyton Talbot, he's a guy that I know is going to make mistakes. Like if I was going to bet him, I'd probably try and bet him live after a round because I do think he's got a great pace. And I do think that he has like an ability to keep pushing and try, like, I think he lives to break people in there, like in, in that way. Like, I don't think there's another reason he does it um, because he's kind of like an, a weird esoteric guy. I watched one of his YouTube videos. I was like, what on earth? They're like pole dancing and all these crazy things. He's a wild boy, but when you look like he can fight, right? He can, he, I do think he has real fight skills as well. Um, and Reno Academy of Combat, you know, he's been training around a lot of high level people um, in his life, you know? So I do think he's a guy uh, that's put together a good skill set. Do I think that this is an easy fight? No, I do not. So I'm not going to go lay the chalk. This is kind of like a Dolgarian situation. I thought Dolgarian won the fight, but I can also admit it was a bad bet at minus 190 easily. So it's like, in this spot, I don't want to live to say, you know, it was a close fight and, and Peyton Talbot scraped it, you know, 20, uh, you know, it was a 28, 29 uh, majority decision. Like, I, I don't want to have that ticket, but I do feel like he's going to end up getting the win here. I will just say, guys, I know very sharp people. I Like, I have a sharp network and I can't tell you who is betting what. But what I can tell you is I know people that are extremely sharp that have max bets on both sides of this fight. And when that happens, I'm normally like, Maybe I take my oars out of the water. You know, maybe I just wait and uh, and and pick a different uh, target on the card because I don't like betting into really sharp opinions. And I could just tell you there is very sharp money, huge amounts of it on both sides of this fight. And that's why the line has been a little bit of a tug of war here as well. So um, peace, love, and chicken grease. God bless. If I'm on anything, I'm probably in the prop market uh, for this fight. So keep that in mind. Let me diss him some more, bro. Yeah, so this Peyton guy, when you're talking about skills, I gotta disagree, man. I don't think he's got any skills, to be honest. I think he's got good size, good frame, probably on the juice as well. Like just looking from his physique and like the cardio he has, he's got a chin on him because he's young and he hasn't been cracked enough yet. But in terms of his striking, like I'm not seeing anything like technical. I'm literally seeing him like wing punches from his hip. Um, his jab's a bit sloppy. I just think it's the opponents that he's been facing have been making him look half decent, man. If Simon wanted to, I feel like he could use the range better, you know, um, pop in and out um, and tag this guy up. And then, yeah, his IQ, man, when you listen to his interviews, he's talking about, you know, I don't live for fighting. It's just something I do, trying to be all fucking Jim Morrison and shit. Like, you know, fighting's just whatever to him. <laughs> Um, Mike Davis yeah. did the same thing last week, though, and he tried to honey dick you into betting the Todd Levy. And I instead was like, I'm just going to take the plus money fight not to go the distance and move on. And I don't know what I'll do in this fight, but like that was the thing for me, like wh where I can never lay minus 500 on Mike Davis. He said the, all the same things about like fighting. Mike Davis is good, though. I, I feel you, but I'm saying like that, that as like a part of the cap. Like, he was like, oh, yeah, like, fighting's just whatever. That's funny, though. <laughs> Please continue. Yeah, I liked Mike Davis. I remember us disagreeing on that. And that's just because Mike Davis has got the skills. I don't mind candidness from people. Like, you know, I don't mind fighting, but I'm not really into it. I'd rather be a podcaster. That's fine by me. 
But I don't know. I can just read it more into it, into Peyton. I literally think he's a phony man. When I seen him on that interview doing his nunchucks, some guy came up to him and he started being a prick to him, like, get the hell out of here. It was some bum asking for money. I don't know if anyone else has seen that interview. It's funny, man. But yeah, just his whole demeanor, man. He just tries too hard to be cool, too hard to be like, you know, whatever, man. It is what it is. Like, I don't see him training much for Instagram. I literally think he's the type of person to take a fight and then once he's finished, go on a fucking two-month fucking holiday to India, backpacking around fucking Asia or whatever. Um, I don't believe in this guy at all or his commitment to fighting, man. I literally think that, you know, he even said, um, you know, I'm beatable. Um, in the training room, I get beat all the time and the rest of it, like, just loads of red flags, man. So, yeah, I've said enough. Fair play. Well, I I'll just say um, another thing uh, that makes me clouded on how I would approach this fight is these guys both have really positive trends, right? Uh, when you look at the Simon side, one and one is a dog, and the the loss as a dog is to Christian Rodriguez, who has done nothing but win, you know, in the UFC, like uh, except for that one fight on short notice, up a weight for his first fight. Um, so he's he's been an excellent out. Uh, and then Peyton Talbot, two and zero is a favorite, forty five percent ROI on his side. So both these guys are running very positive trends into this fight. Probably going to keep my hands clean of the money line side. Next up, my man Edmund Shabazian taking on AJ Dobson. And this is not an easy fight for me to call. Um, you know, AJ Dobson has some, uh, you know, things that concern me on his, uh, on his page. He dealt with a, a pretty serious MRSA infection on his shin. I've literally dealt with the same thing. Uh, not to this extent that he did Thank the Lord in heaven above, but, um, you know, seriously, he had, he had some problems there with his shin for a little while. Um, but you also look at the fact that, you know, he kind of changed gyms. He he got to a different environment and he left the Immortal Training Center, um, you know, Hammer House Gym and Westside Barbell Club and a couple of things that he was doing over there uh, in Columbus. And I think he moved his life to Northeast Ohio, training at Strong Style MMA, um, you know, putting in work there, putting in work at some of the jujitsu spots in the local area. And all I could say for sure is that, um, you know, he's working with some people that are you know, good coaches that care about you and want to see you succeed, right? Like uh, Wolverine Stevens, the guy that he's like posting pictures with and stuff, the, the man has lost his eye in fighting, right? He's a, a guy who's a committed to the game, right? Fought Calvin Cater back in the day, like serious fighter. And he was seeing me just throw shitty left hooks one time and strong style, he comes over to help me work on my left hook. Like that's the kind of guy he is. And he's in the corner for Dobson. So like Dobson's getting individual attention every day, trying to get better. Um, and I think that that's only something that could be a benefit to him. He does have athletic skills. He is an explosive guy. He does have power in his hands. And we've seen that regionally, but he hasn't really translated a lot of that to the UFC. And I think a lot of it's been, he's getting caught watching, you know, he's not throwing enough. He's not using his skills enough. Even in the Petrosian fight, he got a couple of takedowns. He got a couple of good positions that I isolated as like reasons why Adolfo Vieira was probably going to win the fight. And like, when I looked into that fight, I was like, man, he could have made more of this, but his jujitsu really wasn't there. Like he'd get the takedown and just couldn't latch onto, uh, you know, a good position, but it does look like he's been training a little bit more of his jujitsu, trying to get better on the mat. So I have some questions coming into this fight because man, Edmund Shabazi, and I feel like has been exposed so many times and yes, he's been exposed against high level guys. That's the thing that you can give him credit for. Like, Hey, these are all ranked guys. These are all serious fighters with real skills, um, more proven than Dobson. All that's obviously true, but he does have, you know, some flukish wins as well. You know, Brad Tavares went three, uh, you know, hard fives with Drickus Duplessis, and he got head kicked in the first round by Edmund Shabazi and his light shut off, right? Um, and then other guys that are not known for uh, their particular durability, like Derek Brunson, were able to go into the deeper waters with him and end up finishing the fight. Jack Hermanson, a guy that struggled at times with his durability, was not able to extend there. Uh, Nasruddin Namabov, a guy who hasn't been finishing at a very high clip, was able to go out there, put him flat on his back and finish him. Um, so obviously we've seen, you know, good ground game from all of those guys, all high level grapplers have beaten him. Uh, and I don't think Dobson's proven that he's of that ilk, but I do worry about a guy like Edmund because cardio is a hard thing to fix. And I do feel like we've seen some quit in Edmund at times. Um, 
you know, has he made some improvements at Extreme Couture? I'm sure he has. He's a much younger athlete in this fight. I think he's got a lot of things going for him. But for me, he's just a hard guy to trust. Um, so that's how I feel about the fight. How do you feel about it, Rich? I think Edmund's going to fuck him up bad, real bad, man. Um, I think AJ is shit, to be honest. He beat Tafon by being a weasel. Had to get his takedown in round three and lay on him. Um, prior to that, he was getting calf kicked up. Uh, wasn't doing much offensively himself, just throwing enough to like, you know, get through the round. Always wearing knee braces on his knees. Don't know what the fuck that's about. Bouncing around from gyms like you were talking about. And yeah, I think right. He's had thing, multiple man. surgeries on yeah. his knees. Surgeries, 32, shit anyway, old. No offense, but obviously that's offensive as fuck. But yeah. Edmund by submission. Write it down. It's plus eleven 1, hundred. Took it half a unit. I think he's gonna fuck him up, man. I think we can make allowances for Edmund's losses, you know, against Imavov, even against Fluffy, man. Fluffy done what Fluffy does, but you know, he was almost hitting the guillotine on Fluffy. Fluffy had to roll to his back to stay safe. Um, he's got good jiu-jitsu, man. Cashed on him before against um Jack Marsham, Marshall, whatever his name is, back in the day. And plus eleven hundred by Edmund via sub is crazy, man. So I don't say luck of the week. I think luck's a, a stupid word to be using in MMA, but he's safe as fuck, I think, this week, Edmund. I just don't like the money line price, man. I don't like betting anything over minus 200. I know he's there slightly, but it's not my style, man. So I, I tend to look for props when anyone's, um, you know, bigger chalk than that. So, um, yeah, I hope that... Um, I think Edmund has been... and ends by sub is kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting to me. Because I think well, the only AJ way AJ can sub him. I think the way that AJ could sub him is if he breaks mentally. <sighs> like I, I'm not, dude. All I'm saying is this, Rich. This guy has fought 15 minutes over and over, right? Has it been at a high pace? Has it been against the best guys? No. But when I've seen that from one guy, and the other guy has always struggled when the fight is going eight minutes, nine minutes. I'm like, I just know that this could start to go sideways for Edmund. Because if you end up on bottom at 185 pounds, it's going to go sideways for you if you're tired, 100%. Like, it's just going to start to go sideways really quick. But um, that I, I think that TG hits the nail on the head. Dobson could sub him solely on cardio dynamic alone. That's exactly how I feel. Or like club and sub or cardio dynamic. Um, but I feel like more often than not, it's Edmund. But I just feel like you're probably going to get plus 500, plus 600, something on the end by sub, it, just in case, right? Like you, you want that in case uh, Edmund's like oh, huffing and puffing on you, but then Edmund is the upside play at the plus 1100. He's the favorite. It's how you buy down on a favorite. We tried that with Kennedy and Zechiku last week. Didn't work out, but I do think more often than not, that is a better way to play it. So interesting spot in any case. Um, you know, I, I was excited because I was like, man, I got the Dobson narrative. So like ingrained in my brain. I'm like for Mark, the hammer Coleman, he's coming through. And then I looked and it was like, end of my time at immortal end of my, I was like, all right, I'm out. <laughs> and for that reason, I'm out On to the co-main event of the evening. For some reason, we've got Carl Williams taking on Justin Taffa. And I got to tell you. This is not a fight that I feel, um, you know, extremely bullish on. I think it's a very weird fight to have. Justin Taffa doesn't have much tape wrestling or grappling. I have to assume it's bad and it's not as good as Carl Williams. Um, but I also have burnt some money on Carl Williams uh, finish props against these low level UFC fighters. And he's just refusing Same. to go out there and attempt anything, man. It's sickening because he like when I see you go out there. Uh, and take down Jimmy Lawson like it's no big deal and out wrestle him, out grapple him. That's a Tom DeBloss purple belt. Uh, they don't give those out like, uh, you know, candy. And then on top of that, it's like he's a, a really seasoned wrestler and he just got dominated. You know, it's like, oh my goodness, this guy, Carl Williams, has to be really strong. He's going to be outweighed by 25 pounds in this fight. So it's like, you're going to have to be strong. And Williams should be able to take this guy down and dominate him on the mat. But I do just worry that, like, when you're trying to take down a guy who's built like a refrigerator and the guy that's going to be throwing uppercuts and overhands, it's like, you could just get clipped at heavyweight. You know, that's the one thing that I, I would be worried about laying chalk here uh, with a guy like Carl. I think his marketing upside is about zero, but I think his fighting is pretty good. 
you know, so that's why I don't understand why this fight was put together. You know, I think he's probably likely to go out here and get takedowns, but on the other side of things, it's like, I do just imagine like, this is a fight kind of thrown together. I don't think they really care that much about this card. And I think that might just be what it is. Carl might just go out there and dominate him on the mat. So um, that's kind of how I feel about it. Do I donate to the sub prop again, Rich? How do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it's risky, isn't it? I wouldn't be laying the money line on Carl or, um, you know, putting him in parlays. He's right at that parlay buster range. I don't think he's Edmund on the main card. So I think it's either Carl or Rose and Amajunas who are the parlay buster, man. So we'll see how the card progresses, isn't it? But I think the way to tackle this is put some money on Carl ITD because if he does get Taffer down, I think he's going to have his way with him. I don't think Taffer's got the get up game of, you know, previous opponents, even though they were shit, you know, Bretsky or um, Chase Sherman, you know, he struggled getting chased down in round three when um, he was tired. So, yeah, I'd attack it that way, then bet live maybe on Taffer. If Carl doesn't get him out there in round one, you know, um, midway through round two, I'd be sweating a little bit, man. I, I might then look to um, play some Taffer a little bit live. But, um, yeah, this could be the parlay buster in Carl. Minus 190, minus 200. Who the fuck's playing that, man? Yeah, I tend to agree. I, I do think he showed in his last fight he's not completely dead on arrival if he doesn't get the takedowns. Um, but it's still not a proposition I would like to have here because I just don't feel like he's a very dangerous guy um, yeah. unless the fight's on the mat. So that's not he's something I want to be holding on to at heavyweight. He's our major as well. He's not a heavyweight. He's a 205 uh, putting on some weight to fight these heavyweights. He comes in at 230, something like that. So he's doing the uh, the Almeida thing, man, coming up to fight these slow heavyweights and hoping he can grapple fuck them. So um, sooner or later, it's going to bite him in the ass. Yeah, I, I do tend to agree with that. And on the top of side, he has gone 15 minutes thrown at a decent clip in terms of volume. So like if it does just end up being a fight on the feet, he might just outland this guy and like it goes to decision and burns everybody that way um, where the decision goes to Tafa because there are no takedowns and it's just a little bit more on the striking upside. Um, yeah. The other thing to mention, Tafa's a little bit younger here, right? 30 years of age, 34 years of age for Carl Williams. So not a lot of marketing upside. Um, I have to imagine the UFC would prefer Tafa's winning this fight, but I also just think it, it's not a fight that they care about. I don't think it's a card they care about very much. And, uh, I think that just is what it is, but we do have a great main event here, right? A relevant main event. You got two women, uh, that have achieved at a high level, right? Amanda Hibas, black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, I believe she's also a black belt in Judo and, um, you know, she comes from a lineage of martial artists, right? Her family, um, her father, uh, great Brazilian Jiu Jitsu martial artist as well. When you look at the clear deficiency for Amanda Hibas, it's her chin. Right. Like, it's just like, let's not beat around the bush. Let's just be very straight and to the point. Um, She's been knocked out regionally. She's been knocked out in the UFC. And I did have Macy Barber on the money line. I did say I endorsed Macy Barber by KO at plus 425 in that last fight um, because I just thought Macy was a harder hitter. Um, I thought she was way too physical for her. Um, and that was ultimately the problem for me, Rich. I feel like she's a tweener. I feel like she's stuck between these two weight classes where you've got 125 uh, where there's big women, long women like Caitlin Chukagian, um, you know, and then women that are powerful, too powerful for her that could hurt her um, and that could back her up. Now, this is two former straw weights, right? Two women that fought at 115 pounds. But when you think about who's a little bit more powerful and dynamic as a striker, I'd say that's probably Rose. And then I think when you look at who's probably, um, you know, demonstrated a little more finishing upside in rounds one and two, let's say, uh, I would think that's also Rose more often than not. However, you look at the other side here, and I think there's a clear path to victory for both fighters, which is Rose Namajunas could clip Amanda Hibas at any point in this fight, because we've seen Amanda Hibas could go out there and have a great round one, right? Marina Rodriguez, minus 300 favorite for Hibas, takes her down, gets on top, doing great, and then it all goes sideways in an instant in round two where she gets knocked out twice. Brutal finish. Referee did her no favors. Let her just keep getting bobbled all, all around the place. Um, and so that's hard to watch, right? I think part of that, and I mentioned this on Twitter this week. I, I'm curious what your opinion is here, Rich. But I thought 
that it was a mistake for the UFC to have Amanda Hebos go up to 125 pounds to fight Paige Van Zandt and then cut back to 115 right away to, to fight at Marina Rodriguez. It's like that ballooning up and down in weight is not good. And when you look at Amanda Hebas, that's my only criticism. She typically is ballooning up and down in these weight classes. She's not sticking to one weight class. And I think that's because 115 compromises her chin. But I think 125, she's just a little too small for some of these women that are really powerful and big and cutting a lot of weight. So I just think she's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place in terms of looking for title contention. But when you're looking at, are there vulnerabilities on the Rose Nami Yunus side? I mean, number one, guys, she just didn't fight Carla Esparza. What you want to make of that information, like how you want to interpret that, how you want to feel about that, you feel however you want about that. She didn't fight her. Go back and watch it. Watch the tape. Nobody wants to watch that fight because it's the worst fight of all time. I don't want to watch it either. It, they didn't fight. So I think that when you look at uh, how she's been performing lately, she's been a little passive, right? She did land a bunch of shots with Manon Faro, but I thought that we didn't see the same, the same sting, the same intensity. You can label that as the injury. I think that's fair play. But I just worry in this fight, like, what version of Rose are we getting? I can tell you the UFC has put out marketing material on Rose as recently as, like, 90 days ago, like a 90-minute documentary. Like, they still go hard for Rose. They love this girl because she's gone out there on pay-per-views, big events, big fights, won the title, you know, um, very marketable. Both these women have millions of followers on Instagram. Like that's not common in the UFC. You could just look, you can list the number of athletes. There's many, but there's not that many. And like, these are some of the popular athletes. When you look at this card, there's like four athletes that have a social media following that would be worth money. And then it's just like, boing, it just drops off a cliff, right? That's just the truth of it, right? So when you're looking at these two women, they're the selling point of the card. Two beautiful women. They're both still theoretically in the prime of their career, 30, 31 years of age, right? And on this fight, I feel like there's potentially some overconfidence on the Nama Yunus side. Why do I say that? Because Nama Yunus has typically fumbled as a favorite. That is typically when she's stumbled in her fights. As a dog, she produces. As a big favorite, she has let people down time and time again. And, uh, that is the worry, I think, here. She's 3-3 three and three, uh, as a favorite in the UFC for, I believe, a negative ROI. I'm pulling up my document right now. Negative uh, minus 23.7% ROI for Rose Namajunas as a favorite. Amanda Hebos, as a dog, on the other hand, has a nice positive trend uh, in that underdog category, 2-1 and one for 71.7% ROI. So I, I put together really serious documents each week to try and get uh, you know some advantages. And uh, I think that for me... That's one thing I'm looking at here is uh, positive trends. When I look at the stats, some of the stats suggest that Hibas could have a path here with this grappling. Um, you look at who she's grappled with. She's grappled with very, very talented grapplers and done very well. So I do think Amanda Hibas is a very proven woman on the ground, but I worry about her chin. Um, I wanted to bet the fight not to go the distance, Rich. That was what I had said at the beginning of the week. I was like, you know what? Why get married to a side here? Let's just bet the fight not to go the distance. And then... It's like minus 180 for a women's 125. I was like, get out of here. What are you crazy? So I just felt sick when I saw that. Um, how do you feel about this fight, brother? I think it's an interesting one. I don't have the strongest take, but I just feel it is a dog or pass situation for me based on how I typically approach the sport. Yeah, that's a wild price, isn't it? Fight doesn't go the distance. I'm looking at the uh, the odds now. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Yeah, I think um, the way I want to bet this fight is either by submission at plus uh, 400, plus 500. And because I think Rose has got quit in her, or she hasn't showed it recently, but, you know, she showed it me in the past. And like you said, we don't know where her head's at. She's a bit of a head case, man. She's not mentally all there. So who knows? Um, and then, yeah. Ribas, good at jiu-jitsu, but she's got that dodgy chin, man. If she gets cracked, you know, it's not like she goes out um, straight away. It's not like lights out. You know, she wobbles for a bit. I can see Rose jumping on her, a club and sub situation where she takes the neck and fucking chokes her out. It's not out of the realms of possibility. So, um, yes, either by sub at plus 500, I think it's a good look, man. Um, Rose was talking about her power. I've had so many people comment on this fight, man, in the Discord. Everyone being mean to Rose, you know, talking about Pat Barry a fucking again and that whole situation. Um, listen to her interviews this week. She was saying some things I don't like, um, you know, 
they were like, what you've been up to, um, what you've been doing recently. And she's like, oh, I've been talking to God. I've been, um, you know, reading my scriptures and stuff like that. She just, she just gives me weird vibes, man. Um, she banks and around from gyms as well. She doesn't seem to have the best training partners these days. Someone sent me a video of her in her last fight talking about the cut man saying he was a weirdo. He was touching her arm and stuff. Um, she's a dangerous girl to be around if you're a guy, man. Fucking, do you know what I mean? I don't know what the situation was, but some poor fucking cut man's like taping up your hands. And then next thing you know, after the fight, she's basically accusing you of being a fucking pedo, a weirdo, touching her up and stuff and looking at her weird. She's a, she's a weird, dangerous girl, man. Um, so yeah, I don't know where her head's at. That's what I'm going to bet, either by sub. Um, and I hope Ribas does sub man. Like you said, the media sides, I'm very surprised they put this fight together because both girls have got high ceilings. You know, I imagine Ribas, um, like you said, her family and whatnot, her social following, she's a girl you can get behind, man. And Rose, you know, you can keep replaying that Wiley head kick KO and you can pump her up, fuck Rose and that, you know. She's a good endorsement for like girl power and the rest of it with a fucking shaved head. So yeah, I'm surprised they put them together, man. But I'm interested in either by sub. And if one of them won the decision, I'd probably say Rose just because she's got the clear stand-up advantage. Um, I think she understands range management better, um, better footwork. And, you know, she has always got that chance of KOing um, Ribas where on the other side, Ribas isn't a decent striker, in my opinion. You know, she's got the herky-jerky movement she always does. But in terms of throwing and technical ability, I don't think she's that great, man. She's a jiu-jitsu girl, in my opinion. She's got the judo to get it there. So that should be her, um, you know, objective in this fight. But we're seeing it, see what she chooses to come out with. Yeah, I, I think that if I'm in Amanda Hibas's corner, I am saying we're taking her down. We're getting like takedowns as quickly as possible. We're pushing her against the fence. We're not exchanging at distance. I think that that could make Rose complacent. You know, I think that could make Rose a little bit discouraged. I do think that she likes to be confident. I think she likes to be the bully early. I think that in a big cage, this would be a harder assignment as well for Amanda Eba. So let's be very clear about that. Because when you're yeah. looking at that big cage, she's got to chase her all around there. Rose has very good footwork. But in the small cage, I do think that could be a little bit of a problem. The other thing I'll mention, uh, just because you had brought up the training, you know, she had trained with Trevor Whitman and, you know, that's no longer happening as far as I understand. Certainly he's not going to be in the corner this weekend, but she did go back to her original training facility, right? The Academy in Minnesota, I believe, um, uh, with Greg Nelson. Um, so I do think that was her original MMA coach um, and yeah. she's been fighting her whole life. So when you look at Rose, you know, she could be like a, Henry Cejudo, uh, Jose Aldo and retire and come back in a couple of years. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, that's my concern with a girl like Rose, just because like she talks about it, e even in that documentary where she's like, you know, sometimes I wonder why do I do this anymore? Like I've done it so long. And like, you know, I used to have all these traumas Monday in my life. Now I'm a much happier person. I agree with you. Uh, that's why anybody would, would continue to do this crazy living, but it's also, you know, um, I do think she's somebody that likes the glory and like, at a new weight class, she could technically, you know, come up with something here. So it's like if she could get a, one big win off here, she's she's right there in the title conversation because uh, that's how the UFC works. You got a big name, you're a former title uh, fighter, and then you get a, one big win up a weight class. Of course, of course, they're going to give you the big push. So I think both these women have a huge opportunity in front of them. Uh, I think both of them have a path to victory. So for for me, that's what makes me lean towards Amanda Hebos potentially having. Um, some betting value, some marginal betting value. I mean, this line has gone all over the place. So for me, I would wait uh, and I'm going to see what this line peaks at on the underdog price to decide if I'll get involved. But I've had terrible luck betting against Rose Nami Yunus. Um, so for me, I've also kind of just learned some lessons there. Like I cannot lay chalk against her. That's one thing I know for sure. Do you and, know what um, she said? What's that? Do you know what she said about Trevor Whitman? Somebody asked her the question, will he be in your corner? She said, no. He said, do you want to elaborate on that? And she said, uh, I'll talk about it after the fight. So Summit's gone on there. I don't know what the fuck she's going to come out with. She'll probably say you touched a bum or some shit, some weirdo shit. But it's just ironic to me. You know, she goes on about people being weird. Dude, like the I, cook do man. Think, I think Trevor Whitman is a strange guy, though, bro. I remember... He, yeah. Like, there's videos of him, like, in the corner when his fighters are getting, like, knocked out, and he's like... 
kid yeah. just got the biggest smile on his face. I'm like, bro, what, what what's the matter with you, dog? Like, I would be like, I would be Aldo's corner when they all start crying. Like, oh, no. Like, you know, that that would be me, not a sociopath reaction where it's just like, like it's going to be interesting. Smiling. I want to know what it was, man. Um, but I guess we find out after the fight. But yeah, it's just ironic, isn't it? She chills with him for like a, a few fights, but yeah, she's calling other people weirdos. Um, so yeah, I don't think she's the best judge of character, man. Well, she's not. She goes out with Pat fucking Barry. So she's the worst judge of character, man. Weirdo. I, I have <laughs> I have no comments on that situation. I do not understand it well enough. Um, but all I will say is uh, I do think it's an interesting fight. I think it's very compelling. I think somebody is probably getting finished. But I do think that the the value would not be on that because the bookmakers are, are agreeing, right? They've, they've chalked that out. So you have to get creative. Uh, Rich, I looked at the same prop that you talked about earlier this week, but I wanted to wait for some of the square books that I deal with <laughs> to open up their prices. So, I mean, I, we, we, no, 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 no. I, I agree with you. I think um, – you're on to something there. Uh, it's just a good way to target it, right? Like a lot of books that are sharp are holding a Mandy Heba sub 600, you know? So it's like, you're not going to take the end sub at a similar price. Like it's just way better EV situation. Nami Yunus has, is a proven club and sub fighter. She's done it many times. Um, you know, think of the Michelle Waterson fight where she hurts her bad. And then because Michelle didn't want to get out of there, she just was like, okay, snatch up the neck. So I think both these women have submission capabilities. Uh, I think Amanda Hebos would rinse her on the ground, just being truthful, if they're both sober. And what I mean by that is she hasn't been rocked by a punch. She's not all over doing the stanky leg. If you just look at Amanda Hebos, her grappling pedigree, she grappled with Mackenzie Dern just fine in the UFC. And that's like a testament to how good she is on the ground, period, point blank. If you guys don't agree, like that's fine. But like Mackenzie Dern is the truth on the mat. Um, and she shut up, shut down her jujitsu and boxed her face off. So, um, shout out to Amanda Hebas, fun girl. Um, I lost nine and a half units, Rich, on the Caitlin Chikagian fight. And to this day, I thought she won that fight, but <laughs> brutal decision goes against me there. And that's the other thing is like I've had a bad capping history on these fighters, so I would rather not pick a side and get a little creative here than uh, you know face plan on one of these fighters again. But I did say earlier this week. Keep on punting. Sometimes it just takes one. Ten units. Carla Esparza. Give me all that money back that I lost with Wei Li Zhang. Thank you so much. Run me that paper. Rose was like, I'm not fighting tonight. No, thank you. Give me well, money. <laughs> you know, it's interesting when you say that. I checked out who I'm good at betting on this card. And I couldn't hit water out of a boat betting on Erosa. So don't listen to what I said about the Erosa fight. But when it comes to Rose, I've got like 20 units. I don't miss, man. So... I've been pretty spot on when it comes to um, Nama Junis, man. Hell yeah. So shout out to that. Shout out to the fact that Fight Numbers is now sponsoring the show. Appreciate that they're doing that. Guys, Fight Numbers has live odd screens that they are adding to the program that are exceptional. Uh, something that I really value myself as a better is knowing where the best price is. I'm constantly searching out the best price and the tools that they have produced I'm very, very impressed by. So I can give a full hearted endorsement of John Kelly and his product and his service. Um, appreciate what they're doing. And uh, just wanted to say shout out to them. Thank you for the sponsorship. Guys, down below, all the information that you need is in that description box. If you need, use that promo code LAM. They'll hook you up with a 50% off discount. 50% off discount. You heard me right. So promo code LAM, you get that discount. Rich, did you have anything you want to add here, brother? Um, no, just fucking, if you want my bets, link in my Twitter bio, uh, cost you $3 per card, got a discord going and yeah, can't wait for the break, man. Cause I'm going to Amsterdam because without UFC, my life is boring and shit. So yeah, I can't wait for the break that's coming up in like two weeks, man. Hell yeah. So we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to the cards that are coming up. It's going to our neck of the woods here. Uh, we're going to see UFC Atlantic City, New York, New Jersey, Beast Coast, East Coast, stand up, represent. Uh, might even be in the area myself. We'll see how it goes. But wanted to just say God bless you all. Thank you all for being here. Uh, if you guys can be so kind, go ahead and drop a like on the stream. Get subscribed to the channel because we're here talking fights each and every week. If you guys have any other questions, comments, concerns, go ahead and drop them below this video and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thanks so much for your time. Come back next week because we're having all the same fun again. Take care, everybody.